Well, good afternoon. A anytime I speak at a conference like this, and it's this late in the day, I'm always reminded of some words that my father gave to me the first time I ever preached in public. Uh, and that was when I was 14 years old. And for the record, I had no business preaching to anybody at that age. But he came up to me and got eyeball to eyeball with me. And he said, there's two things you need to remember before you get up there. And I said, what are those? <clears throat> and he said, number one, the brain can only contain what the bottom can endure. <laughs> and if you can't strike oil in a half an hour or less, quit boring people. So I am fully aware that we are saturated and maybe our, the brain, our, our brains can only contain what our bottoms can endure today. But uh, I would like to uh, land the plane, at least for this section of the conference, on uh, one of the things that maybe is still the most um, notable and ongoing debate related to the legacy of Carl F. H. Henry, which was his, uh, his desire and his vision uh, for cultural change and for the evangelical church to have an impact and effect on contemporary culture. Now I can remember precisely where it was when I decided, at least in a very preliminary way, to write a book on Carl F. H. Henry and uh, address this as one of the topics uh, in the book. Dr. Henry had just died in December of 2013, and I will admit to you it was a personal loss for me, uh, like Dr. Yandel and, and others who uh, ha have uh, known Dr. Henry for these many years. Uh, it, was, it was a great blow to all of us to, to lose uh, that presence in our lives. I have a long, as we were moving to New York, I discovered my stack of correspondence with Carl Henry over the years. He was a mentor to me. And uh, a few months after uh, he passed, uh, I picked up a book from a scholar I greatly respect, uh, Daryl Hart, called The Lost Soul of, um, the Lost Soul of Protestantism. And uh, I read that book, and what, what I got in there, quite frankly, put me back on my heels. Because in this book, Carl Henry is the v villain. He represents a, a retrenchment in terms of the way the church should think about itself in contemporary society. I, had to, I have to say that uh, that particular thesis, it, it at first uh, angered me, and uh, then I went back to do some more exp uh, exploration, and uh, without speaking for, for uh, Daryl Hart, I will say that I think it has something to do with a much broader thesis of his, that uh, he sees a direct genealogical uh, lineage from the new, Devel uh, new Divinity School through uh, uh, the latter part of the Second Great Awakening through Billy Graham and Carl F. H. Henry and the result is the Trinity Broadcasting Network. And uh, I understand the theory behind that, but <clears throat> Carl Henry, I think, uh, uh, deserves to be cast in the light in which he would have described himself, which uh, would have been uh, as a, as a modern day or latter day representative of uh, the Kuyperian tradition, which saw, uh, as Kuyper, uh, we all know Kuyper would say, every square inch uh, in the domain of all of reality being brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And perhaps the most uh, relevant quote from Kuyper on this particular point is this. If we succeed only at rescuing the discipline of theology in our time, we will be remembered as those who had the tactics of the ostrich. If all we protect is the church and our stained glass uh, enclosures, we have failed our responsibility to the world. 
it was that esprit de corps that animated uh, Carl F. H. Henry and was really responsible for his uh, start on the scene in the post-World War II environment. And uh, the, the debate on whether or not cultural transformationalism is possible is still ongoing and it is a hot one. The, the, the people that are, um, that, uh, are still debating whether or not uh, it is the church should have any interest whatsoever in uh, trying to reach culture for Christ rather than just being an intact orthodox church is the stuff of legend uh, if you follow blogs and, uh, and the like. Uh, and it gets very heated at, at times. And it has some weird angles and, and turns. And uh, uh, I, I recently there was, a, there was an article published uh, once, one more time on transformationalism. I was like, oh, I've got to read this. What are we going to read? And it was an homage to James Bannerman, who was a, a Scottish Presbyterian pastor in the early 19th century. I don't think he was up against the same cultural climate as we are today in uh, the flourishing, the full flowering of, uh, this, uh, of, of Christian Scotland, okay? I don't think those are the right people to, to go to. I do think Kuiper is a relevant one to go to, and I think Henry would agree with that as well. Um, when my book came out, I was very gratified that it got as much attention as it did, but you kind of, it was a Rorschach test, and I intended it to be that way to see how pe various different constituencies would respond to it. And one of these folks said, Carl Henry, we don't need to go back and listen to Carl Henry because um, what, all that really matters is that we have an orthodox church. So we don't need his project of cultural change. So what I would like to do is sort of reset this topic about transformationalism look at sort of the, the mood in which it's set in its Reformation heritage, and then get to the central thesis, one more time the central thesis that Henry set forth to evangelicals in the post-World War II environment. And uh, if we want to leave this, if we want to abandon this once and for all, um, I just wanted to have been on the record as having uh, said, this is the way it once was, <laughs> uh, sort of in a Walter Cron Cronkite wa uh, way. And that's the way it was. And if we want to sail off I into a different sort of um, uh, horizon than that, uh, I will at least have been there saying, this is what gave the esprit de corps of evangelicalism to start with. And uh, by the way, someone asked me just uh, before, a student here from, uh, from Moody Bible Institute asked me what was, how would Carl Henry define evangelicalism? And he would always point to the fact, not only does it have something to do with a certain entailment of a view of scripture, which I'll talk a little bit about at the banquet tonight, but it also, and it had something to do with the vicarious atonement of Christ and his resurrection from the dead. But Henry had this phrase that I loved, Christ rose bodily from the dead to be the helmsman of an eternal, moral, and spiritual world. So it's this image of Christ as the helmsman of ushering in the kingdom of God available to us now in space and time. It is a, it, he ushers in a new world and that's what uh, the church uh, represents. So uh, I, I want to I want to set up the, the mood here and then explain a little bit about the signature book that is absolute must reading. If you're going to read one thing from Carl F. H. Henry, it is The Uneasy Conscience. But I want to begin with uh, uh, what Carl Henry would always begin with, which was the mood in, of the time of the Reformation. In 1527, the bubonic plague sped, spread throughout Germany, decimating the population and eventually found its way to the tiny town of Wittenberg. Martin Luther was forced to confront the threat while tormented with various digestive tract ailments of his own, so much so that he himself reached the point of despair. I felt, Luther wrote to his closest friend, Philip Melanchthon, 
completely abandoned by Christ. Melanchthon himself had already fled the plague. Despite these convulsions, both personal and national, Luther intervened on behalf of the masses who were being stricken by the plague. The elector had begged him to leave, but the reformer instead disseminated an essay entitled, Whether One May Flee from a Deadly Plague, and urged political leaders and church leaders to stay behind and engage the situation and set up homes for the sick. True to his word, Luther soldiered on in Wittenberg when everybody else had fled, lecturing to empty classrooms and returning home each night to his Katy and a house filled with those afflicted by the plague. In fact, their home remained under quarantine until well after the plague had lifted. It was during these days that Luther penned the words to his most famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Everyone has his or her own favorite lines or phrases from Ein Festeberg, but the final verse is perhaps the most especially apt to what one of Luther's inheritors, Carl F. H. Henry, saw as his vision for a preferred evangelical engagement with culture. That word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Although a mighty fortress is often viewed as upholding the gospel against attacks, by the Roman Curia and the papacy in context. It seems to be more about what to do when there is no political solution to the threats that a society faces. The hymn reminds us about gospel prerogatives in the face of human helplessness. When the plague strikes, what can save the nation? Americans, of course, are divided as to whether or not our own societal plague is upon us. We are also deeply at variance over whether or not Christianity, or specifically an evangelical version of it, holds the promise of moving us beyond the current lack of social cohesion, morality, and economic verve. Some still answer that the question uh, is to be answered with an enthusiastic yes. Others, weary of the promises of cultural engagement, at best say no. At worst, they mock the notion that religion can really solve anything anymore. In spite of this, evangelicals continue their passion for socio-political engagement. We just simply cannot help ourselves. We, we're, we're in the cookie jar and we cannot stop. The numbers of books on socio-political engagement related to evangelicals and the issue, even for people like Daryl Hart who don't think we ought to be doing it, just keep on coming. It is a situation that uh, brings to mind Jacques Ellul's observation in his fine book of essays, The New Demons, and here I quote, this is one of my favorite quotes, everything is political. Politics is the only serious activity. The fate of humanity depends upon politics, and classical, philosophical, or religious truth takes on meaning only as it is incarnated in political action. Christians are typical in this connection. They rush to the defense of political religion and assert that Christianity is meaningful only in terms of political commitment. In truth, it is their religious mentality that plays a trick on them. As Christianity collapses as a religion, they look about them in bewilderment, unconsciously, of course, hoping to recover where the religious is to be incarnated in their time. Since they are religious, they are drawn automatically into the political sphere like iron filings to a magnet. Think of the Death Star and the Millennium Falcon. That is where we are. And I think this is where Carl Henry can be a real answer for us because his, his version of this was prophetic witness and not political conquest. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. 
Evangelicals have been fascinated by political involvement in part because they believe it is a way of bringing all things in subjection to the Lordship of Christ. We want to change the world. Now, Owen has just talked about Christian colleges and universities, and I am in that business. And what Christian college or university do you know that does not have something about culture change in their mission statement? That is just the way we roll. Uh, we have this question, though, before us, can evangelicals change the world? Is that possible? I spoke at a conference honoring Chuck Colson a couple of months ago with people like Robbie George and Timothy George and folks from Prison Fellowship and others. And I said, if you want to understand how this whole conversation was changed, you have to read this 500-page book. And I brought it with me and sat it down, and it made a big thud. Randall Collins' book, The Sociology of Philosophies. Because in that book, Randall Collins says that there in the whole history of philosophy have only been about 300 people who have had a material impact and effect on culture change. So it's not really possible for average evangelicals in their average evangelical institutions to truly change the world on a macro scale. It's beyond our reach. So what do we do? Well, the answer to that has come from people like James Davison Hunter and his book to Change the World, where he aims once and for all to put an end to this whole culture change racket and this Christian, wor Christian worldview change racket. And uh, he takes a whack at everybody, James Davison Hunter, in, uh, and to change the world. I mean, it's not just that he's criticizing Robbie George and and Chuck Colson, but he also takes a whack at John Howard Yoder and the Wesleyans and the Anabaptists. Everybody comes in for criticism here uh, from this particular model. And Hunter's analysis is convincing and penetrating. And to his credit, he takes theology very seriously. One of the things we appreciate about James Davison Hunter is that unlike theologians, many current theologians who want to be sociologists when they grow up. James Davison Hunter is a sociologist who wants to be a theologian when he grows up. And so, contra the language of culture change, what Hunter proposes is this category of faithful presence. What he means by that is a little bit trickier. He talks about Christians being in their various different fields, being um, witnesses. And I think what he's talking about here is very close to what C.S. Lewis talked about in, uh, in God and the Dock, that famous essay on apologetics where he said, we need to be doing our cr work through a Christian lens with our Christianity latent in our disciplines whether it be in the, in the arts or in economics or in uh, medicine. And it's hard to find any fault in the notion of faithful presence. Um, but I have to admit that that category, if that's all we've got, without a macro goal of broader cultural ambition of the likes of William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect, might be interpreted by people of my generation and below. I'm thinking about my students. If you say faithful presence is all we are about, they will interpret that, I fear, as quasi-quietism. That's what they will hear. And as we shall see, that falls short of the original vision that Carl Henry laid out for what I call in my book classic evangelicalism. Now, one of the things that I find rather delightful is that uh, James Davison Hunter's book came out around the same time as another book uh, that came out by another very prominent sociologist, Robert Putnam and, uh, from Harvard and uh, David Campbell from Notre Dame, and they wrote a book called Amazing Grace. And it is about Christian engagement with culture. And uh, what, what's really interesting is that uh, they have almost the opposite thesis of Hunter, uh, but the irony is, is that they don't take theology very seriously uh, in their book. But here's what they say about evangelicals. They say we are 
On the basis of their research, evangelicals show up in their original factory setting as faithful presences. That's who we are. That's how we roll. We are good neighbors. Regular church attendance at religious services is an accurate predictor of whether or not uh, people are involved in their communities and being faithful presences. So as evangelicals, on the basis of Putnam and Campbell, maybe we ought to just congratulate ourselves and stop beating ourselves up so much. We're a faithful presence. It's part of our DNA. Though we might uh, uh, think that, Putnam is convinced uh, that our good deeds and our general who are our neighbors, Elon, has nothing to do with whether or not what we believe is actually true, critically, in a real sense. For even if it is, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is what we do, not what we believe. And uh, uh, Robert Putnam was speaking at the Southern Festival of Books in Nashville in the fall of 2010, and he was talking about how he'd just been called by David Cameron, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, and said, I've, I've, I'm interested in your research. How do we take the religious spirit of these, you know, Christians that you talk about and just poured it into a secular context? How do we rip it out? Since the belief is not really important, how do we just make that make sense in a secular setting? Okay? And this is actually a project, if you've seen Elaine de Baton's te TED Talk on what atheists can learn from church. What's really interesting is that now across uh, great, the UK and Europe, you now have, and it's called the School of Life actually, where you have atheists that have, they have their own worship services, and they have liturgy, and they have sermons. And they're just trying to do everything that we do, just without any theological tethering to it whatsoever. So that dichotomy between the Hunter thesis and, and the Putnam thesis just brings us back to the continuing problem that we have when it comes to mounting a public uh, theology. And we get into these back and forth debates. In 2002, to go back to, to Daryl Hart, who I deeply respect, he published a very influential essay in uh, the Christian Scholars Review saying that, that we can know that Kuyperianism, that model that we can have a seamless garment of socio-political engagement, theological engagement, um, uh, philosophical engagement, an artistic engagement with the culture, we can sort of run the table is really of a bygone era and really we need to go back to the two spheres model of the Lutheran view which is to say there's secular authorities here and religious authorities over here so that debate still is ongoing and I think that in a way we're at the right juncture to come full circle back to where Carl Henry began with evangelicals after World War II in the uneasy conscience of modern fundamentalism because evangelicals have no consistent program to speak to the socio-political climate of our time. And I think that within the confines of our current environment, we need to ask ourselves, look ourselves deeply into the mirror, and say, is this possible anymore? Can we do this? But before we give up, I want to plead ad fonts one more time to go back to this landmark book and look at the thesis of the uneasy conscience of modern fundamentalism. Uneasy conscience exhibited confidence that even in the worst imaginable period in world history, a globe confused and battered emerging from the Second World War could look to the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and be transformed, not just as individuals, but as a society. Because Henry held confidence in the epistemological gravitas of an inerrant and infinitely applicable scripture, he believed that the church had the greatest potential to help meet the needs of an ailing globe. It was this ambitious, optimistic, and robust vision that stood at the genesis of the evangelical movement. By addressing the political, social, economic, and intellectual questions of the age, God's people, Henry said, have an opportunity to share the gospel that not only makes us right with God, but also makes human flourishing possible. 
That was the vision of classic evangelicalism. Henry's central aim in Uneasy Conscience was to challenge the predominant cultural prejudices held against biblical Christianity and to assert a right understanding of the core tenets and mission of Christian evangelicalism. The project is simultaneously a polemic against liberalism and its failure to give meaning to the world and against the myriad strains of Christianity that denominate themselves as evangelical or fundamentalist or both, but have misapprehended the purpose and calling of true Christ followers. Henry confronts critics on all sides by arguing that evangelicalism is intrinsically linked to the redemptive energy of the Christian evangel in the active and practical opposition of social and spiritual evils in our time. This mission, he claims, is the only means by which substantive, meaningful, and sustainable change can be effected upon cultural and social ills. Henry's opening salvo in Uneasy Conscience addresses the modernist critique against our lack of social conscience. He said, we've got a perception problem. The world does not think we really care. He distinguishes between two categories, the non-evangelicals, which is basically the Gentiles out there, and evangelicals, people that believe the Bible, to indicate differences in prevailing cultural paradigms. He does so out of a very immediate awareness that modern liberalism, in all of its forms, is foredoomed to failure. And boy, if ever there was a prophetic word that by the end of the 20th century turned out to be exactly right, it was Carl Henry's vision of what, where liberalism would lead uh, in the 20th century. His critique, 1947, is hot on the heels of two disastrous world wars and a world climate that uh, had crises that, uh, crises that were unimaginable in generations before. Henry diagnoses the malady of social apathy within Protestant fundamentalism and likewise reevaluates a right understanding of what constitutes true biblical Christianity. And here's a quote from Uneasy Conscience. And the last bit of this is really important. Against Protestant fundamentalism, the non-evangelicals level the charge that it has no social program calling for a practical attack on acknowledged world evils. But what is almost wholly unintelligible to the naturalistic and idealistic groups, burdened as they are to find a new world order, is the apparent lack of any social passion in Protestant fundamentalism itself. On this evaluation, fundamentalism is the modern priest and Levite, bypassing suffering humanity, unquote. Henry points out that not only has fundamentalism become indifferent towards social evils and reform, it has adopted an aggressive stance against many institutions whose efforts are exerted towards the alleviation of social evils, both secular and religious, effectively quashing the social voice of evangelicals almost wholesale. Here's another quote. The social reform movements that had begun in the 20th century, dedicated to the elimination of such evils, do not have the active, let alone vigorous, cooperation of large segments of evangelical Christianity. In fact, fundamentalist churches increasingly have repudiated the very movements whose most energetic efforts have gone into an attack on social evils. Now, such resistance would be far more intelligible to non-evangelicals were it accompanied by an equally forceful assault on social evils in a distinctly supernaturalistic framework. But by and large, the fundamentalist opposition to social evils and ills has been more vocal than actual. In other words, we're not in the game yet, folks, and the world is crying out for us to be involved. Further, the argument in Uneasy Conscience seeks above all else to revive the true spirit of Christianity away from the degenerate qualities that have come to typify its cultural identi uh, identity as regarded by modern prejudice. Quote, 
modern prejudice, justly or unjustly, has come to identify fundamentalism largely in terms of an anti-ecumenical spirit of independent isolationism, an uncritically held set of theological formulas, an overly emotional type of revivalism, and the like. Now, can anyone doubt that that is still the problem that we face today? That the view of the evangelical church is that we're very, very idiosyncratic. We can't get along on anything. Uh, and, and we're constantly bickering and fighting with one another. And, uh, you know, what happens is that we are guilty of, of the, 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 the argument from confusion. Well, if these people can't even agree together themselves on, on what it means to be a Christian in the world, that probably means that there is no coherent answer to that. To, to quote uh, a Bob Dylan lyric uh, along these lines, uh, this is pre-conversion era Bob Dylan, but he says, well, I heard the Sermon on the Mount and I knew it was too complex. It didn't add up to anything more than the broken glass reflex. Henry's saying that's the way the world views Fundamental, viewed fundamentalists at that time. It's just broken glass. There are all these refracting different uh, views on things. And against these imputed qualities, Henry lays out his working definition for what an authentic and exemplary evangelicalism should look like. It was ethically alert and recognized that such tendencies do not express the inherent genius of the great evangelical tradition. Spokesmen, particularly among uh, orthodox reform groups, saw that the title fundamentalism initially was applied mostly to doctrinal uh, fidelity rather with ethical responsibility in mind. So he's saying that in the early 20th century, what fundamentalism meant was that we believe that the Bible is true, we believe in the deity of Christ and so forth, but we've got to see that it means, it means uh, we are against anti-supernaturalism, but we've got to get beyond this, Henry says. We have, to, we have to move beyond and now come up with an identifiable uh, social program. So, how do we avoid this uh, doctrine of inevitability that uh, the world is foredoomed to failure without a vibrant evangelical witness? Henry insists in the uneasy conscience of modern fundamentalism, not only that the core tenets of evangelicalism demand a robust social conscience and rigorous service uh, against social evils, but also that evangelicalism by its nature is more adequately equipped to take this stance than any other philosophical system. After all, an evangelical message vitally related to world conditions is not precluded by New Testament doctrine. Indeed, conservative Protestantism insists that this only estimate of human sinfulness and the need of regeneration is sufficiently realistic to avoid any securely grounded, grounded optimism in world affairs. Any other framework can offer only what Henry memorably calls a bubble and froth cure. And one of the things that is really ironic about that statement is he's, he's calling any other program that's not based upon reality, which is a robust Christian theism, is ultimately going to wind up in a bubble and froth cure. It's just flotsam and jetsam. It means nothing. Now what's, what's ironic, and I'll mention this briefly tonight at the banquet, uh, one of the most preeminent philosophers of our time uh, Peter Sloterdijk, has, uh, his manifesto on how to live in the modern world is called Bubbles. Bubbles. We need to air condition ourselves in our own bubbles because we realize that nihilism is true. So we need to cool ourselves down rather than overheating. That's all we can expect out of ourselves is not to overheat and melt down in the face of a world in, that realizes the death of God. What Henry says in The Uneasy Conscience is that evangelicals are better than that. We can provide a full-orbed solution to address the ills and the cure for Western culture. Now fundamentalists, for their part, when it comes to this part, 
always respond with a collective yawn. I was visited uh, by a, a very well-known um, pastor in reform circles a couple of years ago, and he said, give me your best three reasons why I should not sign up for a new reformed fundamentalism. So it's ironic that we are right back to where we were, uh, where Henry was, in, uh, in 1947. Contrary to this current attitude, which sees evangelicals constantly second-guessing themselves, Henry argued for swagger. Rather than being an outdated, irrelevant philosophy, evangelicalism is uniquely positioned to offer radical and poignant critiques of both social conditions and the modern optimism that initiated them. It is the radically divergent ideological position held by evangelicals that makes such a critique possible, possible in the first place. Quote, the evangelical is convinced that the non-evangelicals operate within the wrong ideological framework, unquote, to make cultural achievement possible. Secularists nurture, quote, a naive and misplaced confidence in man growing out of a superficial view of reality, unquote. By way of contrast, Henry says, only an anthropology and a soteriology that insists upon man's sinful lostness and the ability of God to restore the responsive sinner is the adequate key to the door of the fundamentalist world and making it better. Any other approach is a needless waste of effort and in effect an attack on the exclusive relevance of the historic redemptive gospel." Unquote. And here again we see that Henry was prophetic in his massive 1,200-page homage to Hegel, Marx, and Lacan, the apoplectic Slovenian, Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Zizek titles his program for uh, a view for the future less than nothing. That is what we have to offer the human condition, less than nothing. It is absolute, total ideology is all we are left with. There is no uh, way forward. There is no such thing as truth. And so Zizek just leaves it there. So this string of, of early 21st century philosophers have now come to the conclusion that Marxism ran its course, modern liberalism ran its course, and the radical left has absolutely nothing to offer. As a matter of fact, less than nothing. I think that it is, the time is right for evangelicals to rally around one another again and to revisit some of these central themes set forth for culture change outlined by Carl Henry. As Timothy Paget has, has most excellently uh, uh, highlighted for us today, the, the uh, image of Carl Henry as this kind of um, uh, uncritical supporter of the American common weal is not true. But simultaneously what he was was someone who felt as though it is impossible to outflank the genius of the biblical revelatory pattern for solutions and cures for the greatest ills of our age. And the fact that we cannot seem to bring ourselves to apply the Bible to economics and to the arts and to science is the greatest evidence, Henry, I think, would tell us today, that we do not really believe that the Bible, deep down, is truly the Word of God. If it stops at the door of only theology, if all we do, as Kuiper said, is save theology, as Portia says to Shylock in The Merchants of uh, Venice, we few, we happy few, that's all that we accomplish 
we leave a world, the non-evangelicals, convinced that we ourselves do not really believe in what we are talking about. Thank you very much.